Hey, it's Jim Fisk here, and today I want to talk about low-cost websites that you can build with a project called Plenty. Now, the first question you might have is, what is Plenty? Plenty is a free and open source framework that allows you to build lightweight websites. Now, that doesn't really explain exactly how we do that. A lot of times, there's a lot of different terminology for describing what uh, a system like Plenty is. Some people call it a Jamstack application. Some people call it a static site generator or an SSG. Those are both correct, but I don't really love those terms. I prefer to use a term called a build time render engine, and so a BTR framework. And the reason I use that is because there's so many terms that get thrown around, client-side rendering, server-side rendering, single-page application, multi-page application, but they don't really describe exactly how these things work. It really depends on when these processes happen. So in our project, we do client-side rendering and server-side rendering, but we don't do on-demand rendering because we do this all during the build process and not when the user comes to our site and tries to visit a specific web page. So yes, Jamstack, JavaScript, APIs, and markup, that makes sense, but there's a lot of frameworks that use those concepts that are not build time render engines. So that's what Plenty is. So what makes Plenty cheaper than different alternatives? Well, one is there's no database. So there's nothing you have to deploy in terms of SQL or worry about those kind of things. Um, it's much easier to track your full website using a version control system like Git and be able to deploy it and see changes. And it just has flat files that are JSON, which are web standards. You're able to serve your entire site on a CDN or a content delivery network. So basically this is cheap hosting that you don't have to worry about a backend for. It's essentially just a file storage. And then these servers get spread all over the world so people visiting your site can get files that are close to them geographically. And um, a lot of times traditional CMS technology will use a CDN, but they'll only use it for certain of their assets like images and their static files. We do our entire sites on CDNs because of the way that we build things beforehand before we're actually delivering the products to the users. And then it also has a very simple architecture. So uh, you should save time on ease of development for maintenance and deployments and building new features just because the system's a lot simpler. There's a very transparent layer between the data source in JSON and the templates built in Svelte. So it should allow you to build experiences in your UI a lot easier than you would with maybe something with a little bit more functionality. And the way that we treat our data structure is any valid JSON is valid for your content source. So you know, if you have tricky APIs that you're pulling data from where you don't have any control over how those data are displayed, you don't have to manipulate those and map them to other fields or change things. Or when you're developing a site, you don't have to look up API documentation to know what fields can be used in what places. You can literally put any JSON you want and we'll build the, our site structure off of that JSON. Now, we have something called a discoverable CMS built in, so we'll try to understand and give your users an editing experience based on that JSON, but it's something you can always override if you want to add your own custom field widgets to your, your system. Another thing that makes Plenty really cheap and nice for a maintainer's point of view is uh, security becomes really easy. So there's a lot less moving parts. Static files are what's being served to the user, so there's no real risk of SQL injection or anything that can kind of go to a backend database or manipulate backend code. It's just static files and there's not mu that much you can do to hurt them. If someone were able to somehow get into your system and mess with your static files, they're easy to reproduce again. They're very lightweight things that you can produce, you can deploy to different places, you can take them down, you can completely throw them out and you can produce them again at any time. So your site's not this big monolithic thing that you have to keep your eye on. It's more like an ephemeral thing that can be pushed out, brought down and put somewhere else. It's a lot more lightweight in that sense. You can also do things a little bit more on your client's terms. So if you're a solo entrepreneur or a small agency, then uh, oftentimes you might have this friction with clients where you know you have to do security updates or you have to do these things that are not prompted by their requests. And they might not understand why you're doing those things. And you have that friction and that tension point where you have to explain why you have to charge them for things that they're not asking for. In the case of a static site generator or a build time render engine, the site is pretty secure because it's those flat files. And if there are any 
updates you want to make to packages or dependencies in the tool chain that are used to build the site, you can really do those on your own terms. So the next time your client requests a change on their site, you can go back through and you can uh, update those packages as part of that request. So they feel like they're getting value for what is being done in terms of the work. We also do something called an ejectable core. So all the core files that are use it, being used to do the client side routing, the entry points, the, the CMS files, uh, they're all in an injectable core. So basically they sit behind the scenes in a virtual file system and you never really see them or need to see them unless of course you want to eject the core and change something, which you're more than welcome to do. But if you don't eject anything from the core, basically every time plenty updates, you get those updates for free. So you don't have to worry about upgrading or doing any of that. Essentially what will happen is the next time you run your site, it will get the updated files automatically if you want them to. Of course, that can be kind of scary in a production site if we ever change the API or something like that. So if you don't want to risk us breaking your site by changing the core, you can always lock down your core version either locally or in your continuous integration CI build, uh, which is used for a deployed site. You can lock that down to a specific version so you always know that version is going to work. And then you can manually do this if you'd like to specifically change the version. Of course, upgrading at that point is easy. You just go in and you change the version, just the version number in a file, and you don't have to pull in other dependencies or do any of that kind of work. Now, a central part of the Plenty ecosystem is that we have a get back CMS. Now, a get back CMS is this concept where everybody can finally speak the same language. So currently developers typically use Git, but the client doesn't know or uh, understand Git most like more than likely. So how do you get everybody to speak the same language? Well, the way we do it is with a Git back CMS. So a developer can deploy and see changes using Git, and a client can edit a site through a web interface that just looks like a web form, and that writes Git back to the system. That way you can see exactly what's being uh, done by who, who it's being done by, uh, what time it's being changed, and there's no questions about who's making the changes, where they're making them, and how they're making them. Everybody's on the same page. A developer can come and see exactly what happened. So if your site goes down on a Tuesday morning, you know exactly what caused that issue. Uh, and then it also allows easy deployment. So you can kind of uh, do everything in the same way. You don't have to worry about managing the database in one place and then merging the code in with that, and sometimes exporting things from a database, putting into code, and then deploying it. It's all just Git. Another thing that's nice about a Git back CMS is it ships right alongside your site. So that advantage we talked about earlier about having your site be shipped with a CDN or a content delivery network, a very cheap and efficient way to host your site, your CMS goes right along with it. So you don't have to host this as a separate application. It doesn't need a database itself or server-side rendering or any of those different things. It just ships right along with your site. So it's nice and lightweight. And also the Gitback CMS is really great for this concept of atomic deploys. So atomic deployments are this idea that the full site is built and deployed every single time. So anytime a change is made, you have a full copy of that site that gets deployed. And if you ever need to roll back, it's very trivial to roll back to another working version. Um, it also allows you to do really powerful things like have different deployments based on different branches. So maybe you want your main branch to go to a production deployment. Maybe your develop branch goes to a dev environment. And you can have these really uh, simple packaged atomic deployments that go different places uh, based on however you do your build off of those branches. So it really allows you to have a really integrated, tight-knit system without a lot of overhead. So how does a Git CMS really work? Okay, let's start with an example. In this case, we're going to use GitLab as our, our repository for our project. So GitLab is supported by Plenty currently. We have an OAuth integration with them so we can do authentication to GitLab. So it's a good place to start. Now, GitLab has this concept of continuous integration, continuous delivery, CI, CD. And what this basically is, is this is a container. It's like a Docker container that spins up to do the work for your system. So if there's a change that happens in GitLab in the repository, that notifies CI, CD, and that will do your build. So if something changes your site, it goes through, it tries to rebuild your site completely. And once it's rebuilt, CI CD will deploy this to a hosted environment. Oftentimes this might be something like GitLab Pages. This is a free uh, hosting solution that GitLab offers. So you make a change in GitLab, it gets built in CI and then gets delivered with CD over to uh, GitLab Pages. And then that's displayed on the front end of the website. Now, like we talked about earlier, your CMS ships with this front end display as well. So an, a user at this point can go to the front end of your website and as long as they are authenticated to GitLab, 
They can make changes to the website, content changes, change images, change text. And then when they save, that will hook into the Git API for GitLab and it will make a commit back to the repository. And that way you get this full life cycle and uh, it, it feels like a full live experience, even though you're not managing any of some of those larger concepts like running your web servers or databases. It's really just a simple, light way to get the full editing experience for a non-technical user. So what does Plenty resemble? And if you've been around the Jamstack space in the past, you probably are familiar with two projects, Hugo and Netlify CMS, although Netlify CMS is no longer a uh, supported project, but there's some other groups that have taken over that uh, aspect and it's being developed on, under different names now. There's a variety of different names. Static CMS is one of them. There's a couple other ones. Now, um, not to confuse Netlify CMS with Netlify the company. Netlify the company is a hosting platform. Netlify CMS was a project that they open sourced and it was, it was this idea of a Gitback CMS that you could add to other static site generators. So people often will put Hugo and Netlify CMS together and Plenty is kind of the same co uh, concept. So we have a go back end just like Hugo to do a lot of our work to build the site. And then we have a Gitback CMS. Ours is built in Svelte instead of React like Netlify CMS. But um, it's a similar concept. The challenge with, with these projects together is that you know you don't really get previews because Hugo's using Go templates and uh, Netlify CMS wants React. And you don't really, you can't see those live previews. And there's a lot of other kind of things where you have to map your Netlify CMS fields to your Hugo uh, content source. Now, what we do is we kind of bring these things a little more tightly coupled. So if you can think of it as like a, a Huglify or Huglify CMS. Uh, we're not calling that, it's just plenty. But the idea is it's a real tight coupling between our static site generation done in something that's similar to Hugo and our CMS uh, front end interface, something like Netlify CMS. So that's kind of where we come in with this stuff. So, you know, that's all well and good, but um, you probably want to see this. I mean, people can talk about this stuff uh, all the time, but it's actually really helpful to see it in action. So um, let's take a look over here at some examples. I'm going to bring up the Plenty Project website just so you can see. So we have a bunch of themes over here. If you come here, you can see that there's, there's a variety of themes that we can choose. I actually am going to take a look at this Fit Life theme here. I have this locally. So um, if I come here, you can see that I have Fit Life on my local uh, computer. Now I'm running this off of uh, my, my project over here. So I have a, a local web server running the Plenty command and uh, this site's over here up and running. Now, if you want some basics into just building sites and getting some basic stuff up and running with Plenty, we have a YouTube channel uh, that you're probably watching this video on right now that has a lot of uh, resources where we go through and do some of that stuff. So, so check that out. I wanna focus uh, this talk on the CMS specifically. So in this case, you know, you can add a CMS any way that you want to a website. You could add it as a simple link right in, um, I'm gonna reload this here. Uh, yep, so it looks like I might have changed this uh, locally. Let me, um, that's fine, it's not a big deal, but you can see here that, that locally we have some changes. I could just get rid of those changes by checking out those out. And essentially I got rid of any of those content changes that I had made over here and I could come back here and I should be able to reload this site now. Let's give it a second. And because I'm running my video software, I think these things are going a little bit slower. Uh, and I'm gonna restart this server. And let's give this a shot now. Okay, that should be, okay. So we're there. So because we're running the video software, this is going a little bit slower than normal. Um, but anyways, I, I basically created a login here. So I did a hash login and this pops up a modal. Now, you know, this could be whatever you want. This is nothing specific to uh, the Plentico CMS. So in here, I just, I created a little button that says GitLab auth and I said it's an admin login. I mean, I could close out of this and I could add the hash back in. So that's just um, something you could add however you want. Um, and essentially if I click uh, GitLab auth, um, when I'm local, all it does is it just gives me access because this is not saving to our remote repository. It's just saving locally to our, our um, local site and it just writes back to the JSON of that site. So um, everybody gets access. If you have access to the site, you're just right into your own site. So it's not a security risk in any sort of way. Now you see, you get this admin bar at the top here. Um, there's an edit, there's a way to add new content. There's a way to manage media. So we have our media management. We can upload new files. We can look through our media library of uh, images that we have in the site currently. Um, and I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna look at the edit interface. So 
we built this site here into a component-based architecture. So you can see over here, this, this sidebar opens up where we can see these different widgets here, these component widgets. And you can see that these actually correspond to the different sections here. So I can reorder these. So for instance, if I wanted my about section here to appear above my uh, hero section, I could grab this and I could drag it and I could just move that above that section. I could, you know, reverse these orders. I could click on these little arrows to do the same thing. Um, and so you can do that. You can get rid of sections. I could get rid of, you know, the about and the hero and I could come here and we could run the site like this. I'm going to reload this just to get rid of that change. Um, and then we can come in here. We can actually edit the individual content in any one of these widgets. So um, you can see here that this is the title on the page, but this could, this could be whatever. Um, so whatever you want, right? And then you could come here, you can manipulate different aspects. So maybe you want the fitness club over here to be in front of the best. So you could grab these and you can reorder them. You could change the text here um, like that. Uh, you could come here, you could actually change an image. So if I come here, uh, this asks me to either upload, I can go to my library and change out an image or I can upload a new image. In this case, I'll grab a new image here. So we can open up my file browser. I'll just go to my desktop. I'll go to my cat images and I'll grab this nice fit cat and put it in here. You can see that's the image that's getting saved. So I'll just save this. And you can see that swaps out our image here. So you can see our fit cat now is, is over here instead of uh, the weightlifting guy. Um, so yeah, I can come in here. I can manipulate a lot of different aspects of this site like that. Um, so maybe I'll take another look at another section here to demonstrate some more. I could come here to our bout section. Um, again, you know, it's the same idea, same idea with text. Everything's kind of manipulate, uh, able to be manipulated that way. We have a WYSIWYG editor over here, so we could do some interesting things here. Maybe we want, uh, an unordered list. I can create some bullets here like this. Um, maybe we want these to be numbers. We could come here, we could change those to numbers and uh, we just got to change it like this. So yeah, there's a lot you can do in terms of the editor. You know, maybe you want to, maybe you want a title here. So I'm going to make an H2. Okay. So I can manipulate that text that way. Um, uh, you could swap out more images, change some more things. Let's see what else we can do here in terms of editing. Um, I'm going to change anything in our video. Um, I think that's fine. Uh, maybe we'll come here and let's look at our classes, right? So we have our classes down here. Um, again, I could come here. I could change the order of these classes. So these are also in components here. So maybe I want cardio and strength to appear to the left of weightlifting. I can grab this, reorder it. Um, I can come into the weightlifting one and maybe I want to put a cat here instead. Um, so we could do the same thing. We can just come here and drag and drop a cat. Let's grab this handsome fella here and drop it, save it. So now we have our cat over here um, and you can do a lot of just different changes. Um, we can change these bars. So these are configurable as well. So we have this at 85%. I can come over here and hit this and drag this down. You can see the bars changing over here. Um, I can drag it up or down or change it to whatever value I want. So, you know, this is really uh, the web developer's choice to, to configure whatever they want to make configurable in these sections. Um, blogs are going to be kind of a similar concept, right? So you could reorder these, do, do whatever you want with these. Um, now, these are all components. So we could come here, let's remove our blog, for instance. Uh, maybe we want to add a new component. Maybe we add another another video. Um, so we can just kind of come through and quickly add and remove components here. Now it's on you as the developer to make sure the components will play nice with each other. So you have to kind of define them in a way that works universally. Um, and then there's was we added some metadata at the bottom here. Now, this experience is completely up to you. So this is not something that is going to be, you know, necessarily what your site looks like out of the box. Although we try to discover your content um, out of the box and make some recommendations for you. So you, if you put an array in your content, you can come here and you'll see these kind of components by default. Um, text, for instance, will look kind of like this. Um, you know, this is, uh, we pass a disabled text uh, to this section here to um, kind of gray it out. Um, we try to find images automatically as long as you use the full path to the image. Um, the numbers, we do the same thing like we showed there. Oh, actually, here's a good example. Let's look at a, a, another date field. Of course, I, I got rid of our blog. Let's add our blog back in here and let's come here and look at some of these. So there's date fields, right? So you get a date pop-up. You can come here, you can choose today. Um, you can change this however you want. Um, and, uh, you can actually put in whatever date string format you want. So we just put this in our content source. So it would appear like this. Um, it allows you to, to kind of like have a, a lot of custom, um, control over that just with content without having to do any kind of fancy manipulating in your template. Um, 
all this content over here in your editing experience is also represented simply in uh, JSON format. So if there's ever anything that you feel like you can't really get at over here and you're a developer and you wanna fix something quick, like maybe a field name got messed up, like a field key, you could come here and you could change that um, and it would update your experience there. Um, let's see, let's show another thing here. So I'm gonna reload this. Um, let's, let's just do a change real quick. So uh, in terms of uh, work hard for a better life, let's just say new text and let's come down here and let's save it. So I save it, it says changes are committed. If I come back over to my code editor, you'll see over here, if I take a look and I open this in kit, you can see that the new text has been added here. So, um, so that writes right back to your local file system. Then you could either choose to get commit this or just discard it like we did previously. Um, and that's your choice. And um, let's come over here and just take another look at uh, adding content. So. You can add new content. Right now we only have the pages content type set up, but we can call this whatever and set a file name. And then it we just have a blank page here. So um, uh, we don't add any components by default, but we let you just kind of choose what you want that to look like. So maybe you want your classes and then an about section and you're happy with that page there. It's a new page. I mean, obviously you might change the content. You could come and you could just save this and that would save that, that page to your, your content source as well. So that is your local editing experience. Um, I wanted to show maybe a live editing experience as well. So um, one thing you could do is, let's just open up a new private window. Um, we'll take a look at our agency website. So um, our agency is called Causeworks and um, this uh, we actually built plenty with a lot of our, our Causeworks clients in mind. So um, we work with nonprofits and we get uh, a lot of folks that come to us who, um, you know, they maybe have a, a Drupal or a WordPress site and their site hasn't been updated with security updates in five or six years and they're way behind on that stuff and they can't really keep up because the maintenance is expensive, the site's slow. Um, sometimes the site's completely broken and they don't know where it's hosted and we have to go back to the Wayback Machine and restore it. Um, but Plenty allows us to have a lot lighter experience. So that's why we kind of built this with them in mind, but we use it as well. So um, this is our website over here. We do have very similar kind of uh, login. So we have a staff login. Um, works very similar. So now this is on the remote site. So this is gonna actually kick over to GitLab instead of doing it locally. So this is a hosted site. I just come here and basically I put my username and password in here and then I authenticate, it redirects me back to the site using OAuth, um, uh, using a Pixie OAuth uh, grant. And now we're logged in on our live editing site. So um, I come over here and I can look at our, our repository. You can see here that we had updated um, a service uh, strategy page um, last, but we could come here and we could update something else. So we could come here to maybe our branding page and, and we could say, you know, we could just grab this and we could capitalize it. Um, your brand. Oh, and this is a custom field. This is a just a test I was doing. So um, I changed the, the branding title to a, a test field. So you could actually do custom fields as well if you don't want to use the widgets that we provide by default. But let me come here and I'm going to save this. So it's sending, it's committing those changes. If I come back to our repository over here and I reload this, you'll see that this check changes to a little in progress icon. So reload, okay, so you can see that this is, um, the pipeline's currently running. If we take a look at the branding change, we can come here and look at our Git history. Um, so I guess there was a lot of indentation changes. So um, our indentation got changed because uh, it was automatically committed, but the only real change you can see here that's highlighted is that we capitalized the O-U-R part of your. Um, so that's really the only content change that was made there besides the indentation. So that's gonna run, when this pipeline is all set running, what it's going to do is it's going to deploy it back to our live site. So that pipeline has finished running. We could come back to our site and we could take a look and see this. Okay, so we, sometimes this will get cached. Um, so you do have to break your cache. Okay, so you see that I did an F, uh, control F5 there that breaks the cache and you can see that um, your uh, get got capitalized there. So that is a live change on a live site. Um, another thing I wanna look at is uh, in our media library, we actually have um, some categories here. So you can see like um, these are uh, facets at the top that limit um, where what you're looking at. So we can look at just like staff or just our tech stuff or our resources or services and resources. You can clear your filter up here. Um, and another cool thing is when you go out to swap an image out, it will 
automatically apply those filters. So for instance, this um, icon that we're using on our uh, services page, pages, I can come here, I can click change media. And you can see it automatically applies the services um, category because it, it makes sense that you wanna use an icon of the same specifications that are already put into this. So oftentimes, you know, you have your, your images cropped and scaled to the right proportions. Um, of course, also if you upload something, um, I don't want to do it because I don't want to up upload more content to our live site, but essentially if I came here, you know, I chose to browse my files, um, I could upload it and it would automatically tag it with services and put it on the page. So it's kind of doing a lot of nice things for you. Um, another thing that's happening is if you come in here and you actually try to like delete something, it'll give you some warnings. So it says, you know, are you sure you want to delete this page? Um, so you can kind of confirm, I'm going to say no. And then, um, with media, for instance, if I want to come here and I want to download something or delete it, I would give me a warning here. So if I click, uh, delete, select the media, it says, okay, you sure want to delete this. And it tries to do a lookup and see what pages that this file is currently being used on. So you can go and see that. Now, this should not be a definitive source for whether you should or should not delete, um, your files because this is really just looking for the full file path. So if you're using a partial file path in your content, um, not only is it not going to work with our media browser stuff, um, but it's also not going to be flagged in this sense here. So, you know, a lot of people will try to do things like they'll put the the prefix and the suffix in the template itself, and they'll just use the the variable difference between the file name. Um, we we suggest doing the full path here so you can get this to hook into these different aspects. But essentially, I could come here and I can look exactly what's happening. I can say, okay, um, it's being used on our services page. Uh, looks like a that might have got a little bit, um, there might be a, a base URL issue there. You know, let me show you exactly what's, what, what, we're, what we're looking at there, but essentially this file is being used over here on our, our, our blog post here. So, um, yeah, so it looks like there might be a little bit of a bug there, but that's nothing that we can't hash out. Um, yeah, so I think that is pretty good in terms of showing, you know, a, a local version, a live version of a site. Um, if you really want to see, you know, uh, you know, how we're doing some of this stuff. Um, I can give a quick overview of that. So let me just um, bring up the local site in my NeoVim editor. Um, essentially, uh, a lot of the magic happens um, in your content folder. So, um, you know, you have uh, special name files. So in each one of these content types, these are top level content types, like pages, for instance, you have defaults and you have uh, in our case, our defaults are blank, but you also have um, index. So this will tell what kind of field widgets, uh, sorry, index is the homepage. Uh, schema will tell what kind of field widgets we want. In our case, we just want a component field widget. Um, and then we say which components we wanna allow. So, you know, these, this list here is gonna correspond to this list of components over here. Um, whoops. So yeah, and then each one of these is gonna have its own defaults and defaults and schema uh, inside of them. Uh, if we wanna specify further field widgets. And then if you want to add a custom field, so for instance, um, you know, this is a live site. Maybe I should show it on the other side. But uh, what we did here is we added um, a new custom field inside of our layout. So uh, underscore fields inside of your layout will allow you to do that. And then you can define this however you want it to be. In our case, we just said uh, custom field text. And then um, essentially we can reference that in our schema. So what we did, I think we did it on our services pages. So services, if we look at our schemas in there, um, we referenced it, yeah, so we referenced type test, um, and then we passed the disabled option to it as well, so you can't edit it. And that's exactly what you're seeing over here when we look at one of these services, for instance, and they all, the, the titles are just coming custom, uh, test custom field. Um, so yeah, so that's what's happening there. Um, this is probably a good place to cut it. I mean, there's so much more to go into in terms of the nuance. I would love to make a video breaking down, creating this stuff from scratch a little bit more because um, you might be surprised how much of an editing interface you get without setting up anything. Just dropping JSON into a site and then templating it, you will get some sort of editing interface that will allow you to change certain things on your site. Um, and um, yeah, and from there you can just tweak it to your heart's content. So if you wanna um, add certain widgets, maybe you want a color picker widget that we haven't defined, you can define a custom field for that. Or you can say, you know, you want to use certain fields in certain places. So you really have a lot of control over that experience. Um, and it all stays pretty lightweight and um, easy to manage. So um, hopefully this little intro was uh, helpful. And if folks have questions, feel free to reach out, either comment on the video um, or go to the uh, Plentico site. So plenty.co. Um, and from there, you can get a link right to our repository. So just click our little um, GitHub guy at the top here and you can go right to the repository. And if you're not familiar, you know, sign up for GitHub and then come over to the issues, drop an issue in here. Um, 
or, you know, actually while you're here, make sure you give us a star. You know, that really helps us out because uh, we get ranked in a lot of um, aggregator lists and the more stars we have, the more it helps. Um, and of course, you can always um, tweet at Plentico, right? So um, Plentico, Twitter, four slash Plentico, and that's us there. So yeah, um, if you find it interesting, feel free to, to reach out. We would love to hear from you. All right, I think uh, I think that's all I have to say. All right, take care.